As the NASCAR Cup Series heads back to the Phoenix Raceway in 2020, which will play an all-important role in the gauging of this year's Championship 4 race in November, I thought it would be fun to go back and take a second look at the very first NASCAR Cup race in Avondale, Arizona. Hi, Brandon Crossland here, and today I'm taking a second look at the 1988 Checker 500, and a day that would gain notoriety for a very special future legend and NASCAR Hall of Famer. Be sure to leave a like, and I'd really appreciate you subscribing and tapping the bell so you too can join the Crossland crew. NASCAR Winston West Racing came to Phoenix in 1977, but the Desert Mile track would have to wait a decade until the premier division of stock car racing would finally add the track to its penultimate date on the circuit in 1988 placing it as a decisive weekend for any close points battles before the final race at Atlanta. West Coast fans would have to travel a bit further since Riverside had just lost its spot on the schedule after housing took over in the 1987 season. The 1988 Winston Cup standings heading into PIR had awesome Bill from Dawsonville, Bill Elliott, leading the way, but with Rusty Wallace on his trail just 79 points behind. What had gotten Rusty this close was the fiery three-in-a-row streak from the past three races at Charlotte, North Wilkesboro, and Rockingham. At this new venue, Wallace was poised to bring the Pontiac to victory lane for a fourth time and solidify his hopes of a $400,000 championship bonus after Atlanta. The battle between Elliott and Wallace was a close one, and ESPN considered it an outright showdown in the desert. And a corny one at that. Everyone wants to lead the first lap at a new track. With some 63,000 fans on their feet, the first lap gave everyone a glimpse of the action to come. Exciting racing in Phoenix, Arizona. Here comes Jeff Bodine and the others down for a start. Rusty Wallace on the outside of the front row. The green flag waves and here we go. Well, Rusty Wallace would certainly like to lead this first lap, if at all possible. That would give him five bonus points in Winston Cup competition, but Jeff Bodine has taken the lead now. Right now, going out of turn number two, it is Jeff Bodine that leads Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd through the dog leg. Now they go high on the racetrack and dive into turn number three. Now Wallace begins to move in on Jeff Bodine. Would like very much to lead lap number one. He'll try to go inside of Bodine. Coming up four. Bodine a little bit sideways. Side-by-side -side action here. It's going to be Bodine leading Ricky Rudd goes to the inside of Rusty Wallace and tries to get, capture second position but cannot do it. As and Rusty made an aggressive Wallace, tangle with Jeff Bodine to lead lap one, needing all the five bonus points, points he could get, he was there, desperate. Around, it wouldn't be enough. But soon enough, Wallace would get his pace setting lead on lap number three. 27 and Jeff Bodine the pole center outside in number five and Rusty is going to take the lead from Bodine at least momentarily here comes Bodine back however on the outside but look at the number 26 car driven by Ricky Rudd it's also involved in the contest and Bill Elliott is not too far behind in car number nine so Rusty Wallace does have those five bonus points he gets credit for leading lap number three second year competitor Davey Allison ran into issues early As Davey Allison the number 28 Haviland Ford very slow through corners number three and four and he's going to uh, stay out there on the racetrack but something has obviously happened to that car that caused it to slow so Davey Allison has a problem and he has dropped back to the almost the tail of the field now the field would only make it 13 laps until the number 15 Ford of Brett Bodine's engine blew and began leaking oil on the track 
Derek Cope and Jimmy Means would collect each other up in the first ever Cup Series dogleg incident on lap 24. Good, here we got a spin down in turn one. Car sideways in turn number one. Another car spins behind, so two are involved in this. We'll try to get the numbers for you just as quickly as possible. One car is to the inside of the track, and the other one is uh, in the middle of the racetrack. I believe that both of them are going to uh, be able to keep going. Derry Cope is one of them involved in the number 68 car. Here's a replay of what happened that has caused our second caution of the day. That's Derry Cope, who is spinning there in the middle of the racetrack. Derek's car had been a little bit loose. He spins to the outside of the track. You can see the oncoming traffic. Michael Walter in the yellow car number 30 gets down on the inside. And then Jimmy Means. Jimmy Means in car number 52 comes in and spins around. Bill Elliott would be the only car to make their way down pit road after the accident as he would go ahead and grab the four tires and fuel. The field came back to green on lap 28. As the leader up, corner number four, single file formation as the green flag waves once again. Some passing going on back in the uh, fifth position as Dale Earnhardt tries to move up. And I believe he successfully got away that fifth position from Mark Martin. So it is now Dale Earnhardt who is fifth. There are the first three, though. It's Wallace, followed by Ricky Rudd and Jeff Bodine. Well, Dale Earnhardt has done a good job in the early going here, Bob. He started in the 13th position and is now moved up, has now moved up to the 4th position, so he's only to move to the front. The intimidator, Dale Earnhardt, suffered a spin after attempting an inside pass on the number 73 Ford of Joe Rutman. 48, it is Sterling Marlin in front with Bill Elliott running second. As we have a car spinning, that is, I believe it's uh, Dale Earnhardt, is it not? Down the back stretch, kicking up a tremendous amount of dust. That's Joe Rutman, I believe, in car number 73 that's also involved, but there is a second car that spun, and I believe it is indeed Dale Earnhardt. Joe would pull away, but Dale wasn't so lucky. His car would continue, but the incident would end Earnhardt's chances at the title in 1988. After some adjustments, Dale tried to get his lap back on lap 71. Rusty Wallace, however, was fighting for a championship and would show no mercy. Position himself now right beside Rusty Wallace as the green flag comes out, and so Earnhardt is trying to get his lap back. There is a tremendous friendship and camaraderie between Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace, and perhaps, uh, well, I was going to say Rusty may let Dale get his lap back completely, but no, here comes Rusty battling back beside Dale Earnhardt and showing him no corner whatsoever. Wallace wants to keep Earnhardt back a lap. Look at this battle out of four. Oh, they touch. They bang together. Of course, it's a good friend to tap that he gave him there, but also... Hopefully he could get him a little bit out of position, but he didn't get him too much out of position. Here comes Earnhardt back on the outside. The inaugural race would have its fair share of minor accidents, spins, along with hard-fought lead changes between the likes of Neil Bonnet, Alan Kowicki, Sterling Marlin, Ricky Rudd, Texas Terry Labonte, and Mike Alexander, who drove the number 12 Miller High Life Buick for the Stavola brothers. After making their way to the front after a pit stop, familiar face and crew chief Larry McReynolds was confident in his strategy to help his driver Ricky Rudd win the $10,000 halfway mark bonus. Not long after the lap 157 restart, any fight for that ten grand would be halted very quickly as the big wreck of the race would form a flaming roadblock on the entrance to turn one. Several cars are into the wall. This is going to virtually block the entire racetrack. Look at the cars all banged up together, several involved. And we have fire breaking out on one of the cars. A lot of fire seen down there as the smoke begins to clear. We are unable to tell you exactly who is involved in this crash, but we do have some fire that's burning on the racetrack. I know Rick Wilson's car was in. I can see his car was one that was involved in the melee here on the front straightaway. The I think... fireman over there very quickly to put the fire out as the leaders come around now just, will just about have to stop as they go in there because they can't see where they're going. Michael Waltrip and Johnny Rutherford would escape their automobiles as safety crews dodged the flames. Rutherford explained it to Dr. Jerry Punch. Jerry, moments, Johnny. I'm with Johnny Rutherford here. Johnny, first of all, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I got bumped around a little bit, but, uh, you know, I don't know who got out of shape, but all hell broke loose. 
Mark Martin, now out of the race as well, explained how it simply wasn't his year. A frustrated Rick Wilson blamed Greg Sachs. After 17 caution laps, the race would continue under green all the way to the checkered flag. In the closing laps, Rusty Wallace was forced to make a stop for fuel under green, but would make it out right in front of the race leader, Alan Kowicki, to maintain his lead lap status. Alan Kowicki would stay right behind Wallace and would finally take the checkered flag and win his first career cup race in his 85th start at the very first cup event at Phoenix. Here he comes off of corner number four and Harold Kinder has the white flag in hand. There it is displayed to Alan Kowicki who will probably take no chances and may just let Rusty Wallace stay right there. He'll take no chances of becoming involved in any kind of an incident as he is on his last lap now with about a half mile to go before his first Winston Cup victory ever. And it comes at Phoenix International Raceway in the inaugural event here. Alan Kowicki from Greenfield, Wisconsin in his 85th start on the Winston Cup Series. Here he comes out of corner number four. Rusty Wallace a little bit loose coming off here. They're going to cross the line just about side by side, but it is Alan Kowicki winning the inaugural Checker 500 from Phoenix International Raceway. Allen would pull his Xerox Thunderbird to victory lane soon enough, but before doing so, he would make history. Quite a sight. There is Allen uh, going down the backstretch the wrong way on the track. Bob, I have been involved in the sport of auto racing for about 35 years, and that's the first time that I've ever seen the winner say out on the racetrack and go the wrong way but he wanted all of those fans he wanted to wave at them the thousands up on the hills here at the phoenix international raceway and everywhere he wanted to see him he took an extra lamp while you yeah. were talking to him on the radio right and he has been a long time getting to victory lane but that victory lap there is something i had thought about for a long time and i wanted to do something special and never be another first win and i just wanted him to give him something to remember me by alan kowicki got lost bob jenkins claimed Alan Kowicki made a lap around the track going backwards while waving to the adoring fans. The entire sport of auto racing would certainly go on from that day forward to remember him by what could only be coined as the Polish victory lap with Alan Kowicki's family background. The points battle of 1988 would remain exactly the same after Phoenix with the top two still being Bill Elliott and Rusty Wallace lacking 79 points behind. Another notable story was sport veteran Benny Parsons getting what would be the final top 10 of his long career. However, the biggest story of them all was Alan Kowicki christening the new track in town with a special celebration that will be remembered in NASCAR Cup racing for years to come. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to hit a like. And also, if you're new to the channel, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button and also hit the notification bell so you don't miss another time that I upload. Thank you for joining the Crossland crew. And until next time, this is Brandon Crossland, and thanks for listening.